Hello and good morning. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this important conversation on heat preparedness. My name is Devika Ramkilawan and I'm the executive director here at Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House. And I'll be your host today. I want to humbly acknowledge our presence today on the unceded and stolen lands of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, to which I identify as a first generation, generation settler and an uninvited guest. Since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples have respectfully lived in the natural world and have a deep connection to the land, water, and ecosystems that are central to their cultural cultures, languages, and livelihood. Through this intergenerational experience, Indigenous peoples were amongst the first to notice climate change, have shared knowledge, and provided action at the front lines. Indigenous stewardship, including learning from knowledge keepers, is critical to address the impacts of climate change and critical to these conversations. Today's event is a great example of how Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House builds healthy and engaged communities by connecting people and strengthening capacity for change. The purpose of this event is to empower you with the knowledge and resources to protect your health and the health of your communities. I'm delighted to, to share that we have a few watch parties going on with our community partners from Calling, Collingwood, Gordon House and Little Mountain Neighborhood House along with program participants from Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House and those of you that are joining us in community. I want to thank our funders, the City of Vancouver and the United Way for making this event possible. Now, please welcome today's panelists, Dr. Michael Schwant and Sarah Hunt and our moderator, Carolyn Vaughn. Dr. Schwant is a medical health officer with Vancouver Coastal Health, where he works with the Healthy Environments team, which focuses on preventing illness and promoting health and well being in our communities. One important aspect of Dr. Schwant's uh, work with Healthy Environment team is to improve health outcomes linked to environmental factors such as climate change and pollution. Sarah Hun is an emergency planning coordinator with the City of Vancouver's. Uh, Vancouver Emergency Management System, or VEMA. VEMA works collaboratively with city departments, the community regions, and the community and regions to mitigate, prepare for, and recover from emergencies and disasters. Sarah's role focuses on public education, hazard risk communication before, during, and after events. Thank you both for taking the time to join us today. I also want to thank Brenda and Kelly the American Sign Language Interpret Interpreters from Wayfront Center for Communication Ex Accessibility. Thank you for joining us today. And finally, I would like to introduce my colleague, Carolyn Wong, who will be moderating today's conversation. Carolyn leads our Extreme Heat Preparedness and Response Project for Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House. Before joining our team, she worked as an environmental law at an environmental law charity where she engaged people to take action on the intersecting climate bi biodiversity and pollution crisis. I'd like to take a moment to thank Carolyn, who has spearheaded this conversation today. Um, Carolyn, thank you so much. You put a great deal of care um, into the conversation today, and my hands go up to you. I'd want to thank you for all the time and effort and care you've put into this. Now over to you. Thanks so much, Devika. Uh, this topic is really dear to me. I am approaching older adulthood myself, and I also care for and support elders in my family and in my community. And so I'm really interested to learn more about extreme heat preparedness. And I think we should just get started. Let's uh, jump in. So Sarah, I wanted to ask you first, I think it's really helpful that we get on the same page with respect to language and terminology. And I know we hear often terms like heat dome or heat wave and extreme heat. Uh, what do we need to know about extreme heat or what is extreme heat? And what do we need to know about all these different terms that we hear? Totally, really great question. Uh, and I do want to start by uh, thank, thanking everyone again for having me. Um, I live in Mount Pleasant, so I, I love being able to, to support our community uh, even uh, closer than I do with City of Vancouver. Uh, but yeah, about uh, terms, heat dome and heat wave are meteorological terms. 
Um, but Heat Dome, I think, because it was new to us uh, in 2021 and we didn't have the alerting system that we have now, uh, people really kind of held on, held on to that term. And now whenever they think heat, they think that specific event that happened in 2021. Uh, similar when we hear atmospheric river, we think that flooding that happened um, in 2021 as well. Uh, but these are just the meteorological names. What's important uh, and what we're going to be focusing on today are the alerting terms, which are heat warning and extreme heat emergency. So in our region, uh, a heat warning is declared when there is a predicted high of 29 degrees, followed by an overnight low of 16 degrees, and then a subsequent another high of 29 degrees Celsius. So that 29, 16, 29, we see that coming. Um, the province will, will send out uh, a heat warning. Um, and then, and that's considered um, higher than seasonal norms, and it's when we want to start taking action. Um, and then an extreme heat emergency, there aren't specific temperatures associated, uh, but it will be declared when daytime and overnight temperatures are higher than seasonal norms and then continuing to get hotter every day. So if you hear either of those, specifically a heat warning or an extreme heat emergency, those are times we need to start taking action. Thanks, Sarah, that's really helpful. Um, so we haven't experienced either a heat warning or an extreme heat emergency yet this year, thank goodness. Um, but we did experience in BC hotter than normal temperatures in May. And so Sarah, given our changing climate, uh, what should we expect with respect to summer temperatures going forward? Well, yeah, we had our, uh heat state, a special heat statement, yeah, earlier in May. Um, yeah, it wasn't quite heat warning temperatures, but definitely higher than normal and very early on uh, in the season for us to be experiencing that level of heat. Um, on average, BC is experiencing higher summer, temp summer temperatures and more extremely hot days due to climate change. So it's both an increase in the frequency of hot days as well as the severity. Those individual hot days are hotter. Um, and I'm not a meteorologist or climate, climate scientist. Uh, as an emergency preparedness specialist, I'm a bit of a generalist. Um, but I, yeah, I, I do take my, my words from the experts. Um, and we can only pr accurately predict weather about a week in advance. Um, but meteorolog meteorologists uh, expect a warmer and drier than usual summer this year. Um, and it is something yeah, with climate change, we're, we're going to see, um, again, a more frequent uh, and more severe hot weather. So any planning or investing that you can do now uh, is only going to help you out, not just this summer, but moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And Dr. Schwant, you know, we experienced the heat dome in 2021, and it tragically led to the deaths of hundreds of people in, in the province and in our communities. Um, what lessons did we learn from that unprecedented heat event? And maybe if you could also speak to it through the lens of health equity. Yeah, absolutely, Carolyn. There's a number of learnings from this from this event, and it's a really tragic toll. Uh, Six hundred people, more in fact, who passed away. Many of them, you know, among them are friends, families, and neighbors. And it's really important that we learn from that and develop practices that can protect our communities in the future. Um, first of all, I think flowing from flowing from the previous comments, the effects of climate change are already with us. And that's something that really was brought home uh, during those events. We expect to see warmer temperatures, warmer, drier summers every year. Uh, and as well as just those hotter temperatures, more very warm days above 25 or even 30 degrees, the frequency and severity of these intense events, these uh, the, the sort of warnings, the, the temperatures that might reach the heat warning level or the extreme heat emergency level even are expected to become more frequent. Uh, things that used to be rare, things that could have been described as a one in once in a thousand years uh, heat wave, according to, some, to meteorologists in some comments, our heat dome are expected to become more frequent over time. So that's something that we need to know is that 
this is no longer something that's in the distant future, but something that we re really need to live with and become resilient to right now. Um, in terms of some of the specifics that we saw during the 2021 heat event in, in British Columbia, one of the major uh, learnings was that a lot of the risk was indoors and in people's homes. So while the temperatures outside are really crucial, a big part of that is that it's warming our homes. And when we have high temperatures, not just by day, but overnight, the usual cooling off of the home spaces just did not occur. And we saw indoor home spaces becoming warmer day after day after day. And that accumulated heat, that constant exposure was a major risk for people as well. Uh, another piece of that was that there seemed to be a greater risk among people who were living alone. A majority of people who passed away in the report from our BC coroner's office had been living alone. So there's not just that direct physical risk, but the, the social risk. So having social connections to help someone get to a place to cool off, to cool the space off, to seek medical uh, assistance, all of that is very important and less available to people who are uh, who could be living alone. And then finally, as you mentioned, the, Carolyn, the really important health equity piece, we found that there were different impacts of the heat dome. When we look at data from our emergency rooms, from the ambulance calls, and from the deaths that occurred during the heat dome, the different neighborhoods of, of our city in Vancouver, different, uh, different neighborhoods right across uh, British Columbia, uh, had quite different rates of, of impacts. And that seemed to relate to a number of things, including green space in the neighborhood. Uh, which is very important. It actually uh, makes a big difference to keeping uh, keeping uh, neighborhoods cooler and in turn keeping uh, our indoor housing spaces cooler. Uh, material deprivation, so having uh, or having or not having the the financial means to uh, create a cool space with air conditioning, most specifically, uh, and marginal housing, all seem to be risk factors that were very important. So this is something that affects us all, and is likely to affect some more than others as well. So we need to be very attentive to what those risk factors are and what we can do about that as a society. Yeah, thank you for outlining um, uh, some of what we've learned. And uh, my next question, you've sort of uh, spoke to it a bit in your last response, Dr. Schwant. Um, we know everyone can benefit from preparing for these extreme weather event emergencies and extreme heat. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about who is especially vulnerable to the effects of extreme hot weather, um, knowing that we have a lot of older adults who are joining us today, as well as um, their family and friend caregivers? Certainly. The risk factors for illness due to heat exposure can be very complex. And I often divide them into medical and physical risks, and then also what we might describe as more social uh, risks. So under the under the medical piece, the just direct phys physiological risks, we know that older adults, infants and young children, people who are pregnant, uh, can all be at risk just due to diminished ability of the body to cool to cool off. A lot of the cooling mechanisms that we have physically don't work as well as we, as we age. Uh, they they tend to uh, tend to become less effective. They're less effective in in younger kids and children as well. And then also uh, during pregnancy, this is uh, people who are pregnant have different ability of their bodies to cool off because of the all of the changes of pregnancy. As well, a number of pre-existing health conditions can place people at higher risk. So conditions of the heart, respiratory, respiratory conditions, conditions of the lungs, that is, so things like asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, can also place people at higher risk as well. So these are all some of the physical things that can make us more vulnerable to illness due to extreme heat. And then on the other hand, there's also what we could describe as not necessarily direct medical risks, but uh, social risks. So living alone uh, is definitely been found to be a major risk factor for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. It's a lot harder to take action to cool our space off or to get to a cooler space if we don't have that direct uh, social support. Uh, limited mobility and other disabilities can be uh, can likewise have a major impact. Uh, and then being in a hot environment. So being in housing where we have less control of the home environment, a lot of our housing in British Columbia isn't really designed for extreme heat, uh, but being in a in a space or in a uh, tenancy agreement, a housing situation where we're not able to take control of the space and pull it off uh, can also be a risk as well. And then finally, I'm describing a lot of different risk factors, and these can also intersect as well. And we see that, for example, uh, among people who use substances, and that includes alcohol, uh, placing us both at higher medical risk, making it harder for the body to cool off, maybe harder for us to detect if we're experiencing uh, early signs of heat illness, but then also that can link to some of the, the social uh, issues that I described in terms of challenges accessing a cooler space. 
one thing that was found in uh, studies from BC Centers for Disease Control following the heat dome in 2021 was that one of the major risk factors for uh, death, a very high risk group, was people living with schizophrenia in British Columbia who have both medical reasons that it can be that their bodies might not cool off as well, and then also sometimes barriers to cooling services to some of these uh, options that I was describing to help cool off. So there's, uh, again, both medical and, uh, and social uh, risk factors for illness due to extreme heat, and uh, those are a few of the main ones. Great, thank you. So it's, uh, it's sort of a good step that we're identifying those risk factors for ourselves as well as for folks uh, in our community, our neighbors, and our friends and family. Um, and we can also take action and take steps to prepare for these events, and we can empower ourselves in that way. And so, Sarah, let's maybe shift gears, and if you could talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, how should we be evaluating our homes and whether or not it makes sense that if we're in a heat warning or an extreme heat emergency, do we stay put at home or should we be thinking about moving to another space? Could you talk to us a little bit about those different pieces? Yeah, totally. So just as Dr. Schwant kind of talked about like your personal context, even your home where you live um, is going to affect how you experience and even the temperature that you experience. So even like I live on the bottom floor um, of an apartment building is quite shaded. My place to, stays quite cool, whereas someone on, um, you know, a higher in a higher building um, with a lot of windows, with maybe not a lot of cross breeze is gonna experience uh, even higher indoor temperatures. So thinking about even within your space where you can be cooler or not, um, finding the cooler places within your home. So for instance, your bedroom might not be the coolest place. So can you rearrange your furniture or your space so you can um, spend time where it's cooler, especially overnight? Uh, another example is my manager last summer, she ate dinner every night. Um, in their parking garage because it was the coolest space to be. You know, it doesn't need to be, <laughs> you don't have to go too far, you know, figure out what, what's near you. Um, and for people susceptible to heat, uh, the risk increases at indoor temperatures higher than 26 degrees uh, and temperatures higher than 31 degrees can be dangerous. So uh, again, yeah, depending on what's going on outside, really what matters to you is how you are experiencing that, that temperature. So being able to monitor your indoor temperatures. Um, and if you aren't able to cool your space down uh, below 31 or even below 26 degrees, um, having a plan to go somewhere else that is cooler. Mm -hmm. So a good idea then maybe to have a a digital a thermometer of some sort in our indoor spaces so we're, we can be checking in on those temperatures. Um, I love the idea of going into your uh, garage. I know my mom and her neighbor uh, do that as well when it gets hot out just to cool down a bit. Um, and like you said, a simple, uh, a simple action to take. Um, so identifying those locations to get cool is a good heat safety strategy. Uh, Sarah, what types of cooler spaces are available in our neighborhoods here in uh, Metro Vancouver or in Vancouver? And also, what actions will the city of Vancouver be taking during extreme heat events? Yeah, so most community centers and libraries are public cooling centers. They're officially activated uh, during heat warnings, but they're places that are open to the public during normal hours all year round. So, uh, you know, they, they are always available, but um, particularly in heat warnings um, designated as cooler spaces. Um, and then in extreme heat emergencies, um, some of those hours uh, extend as well. Um, but basically, yeah, any other air conditioned space that you can go to that's near you, so shopping malls, movie theaters, you know, neighborhood organizations, uh, if you have family or friends or neighbors, um, sometimes buildings have one room, like common room that is air conditioned uh, or things like that. So thinking, thinking about that, or if you have air conditioning, uh, invite your friends over to, to come stay with you as well. 
Um, so find those areas that, that are near to you um, and then plan how you're going to get there as well. You know, is there a route that's, if you're walking, that's a bit more shaded uh, to stay cool? Um, you know, are there water fountains along the way? Those kind of things. F figure out where you're going, preferably, you know, somewhere close, close by. Um, and then in terms of what the city is doing, so yeah, we've got, well, we activate cooling centers, um, but then we also have seasonal readiness. So things that we put in place, um, we actually put in place very early this year, uh, very early, late April, early May, um, but uh, temporary water fountains and misting stations, which are available 24 seven uh, throughout the summer. Um, and then during heat warnings, uh, we have city, all of our city outdoor workers um, ch are ch doing checks and um, are looking out for people that are outside looking for people suffering from heat related illness. Uh, the city hands out water bottles um, and available through um, community partners such as <laughs> neighborhood houses um, and, and through our cooling centers as well. Uh, and then we also do a lot of um, education and and um, communication out to, to groups to make sure that they know that, you know, a heat warning has been declared and that are, you know, what resources that we have available that have been activated. Uh, there's also modifications we can make at home and also recognizing for some people it might not be possible to move to a cooling center. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So there are also modifications that we can make to our homes. And Sarah, could you let us know, like what are some simple things that we could be doing uh, that would make a significant difference to the indoor temperatures? Totally. So the, the obvious one, but not the most accessible um, for everyone would be to install a window air conditioner, uh, at least in one room, um, or a heat pump. Um, and as I said, yeah, with climate change, it's not, this isn't a one-off thing. It's, it's going to continue to get warmer. So investing in that now will, will help you um, now and into the future. Um, but there's also some other you know, less expensive or maybe more accessible things that you can do as well, um, such, such as installing exterior or um, window coverings and blinds, even just making sure they're closed, thermal covers. Um, and again, these can help you in the winter as well to keep your place warmer um, when it's when it's cold. So another great, great preparedness and a resilience building. Um, if you think about uh, your windows again, like in a, uh, a greenhouse, that works because it's all glass and it gets really warm inside and the same thing happens um, in our home. So even doing something as simple as putting cardboard outside of your windows and covering your window will keep um, your, your place significantly cooler. Um, as you said, having a thermometer is really important to make sure that you can monitor those indoor temperatures. Um, as Dr. Schwant says, sometimes we can't always, you know, feel it in our, our body where we are, where we're at. So better to, to know, to look at, just look for those numbers and, and know when to leave. Um, and also important to point out that fans uh, cannot effectively reduce your body temperature. So using an electric fan should not be uh, your primary cooling method. Um, it's good for moving air around, but it doesn't cool the air down. So it's good maybe at night uh, to bring cool air in your home or, or push warm air out. But again, yeah, shouldn't be your primary cooling method. You should use um, some other ones that we'll, we'll talk about again. Yeah, that was something that I learned while I was doing this work that I didn't know before about the fans not being an effective way to bring your core body temperature down. Um, I've seen Fraser Health has a really great resource available, a one pager on how you can properly use fans. So we'll link to that again in the uh, YouTube description uh, notes. So check for that. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I heard my colleague uh, told me once that it's uh, not, it's what you have in your emergency kit, but it's also who you have in your emergency kit. And I know social connections are just so important during extreme uh, heat emergencies, but any type of emergency really. I love the concept of having a heat buddy. 
Um, Sarah, can you uh, explain what is meant by a heat buddy? Yeah, Tola, you took all the words out of my mouth. Uh, you should do my <laughs> resilient sessions for me. No, um, yeah, uh, social connections uh, can be the most important part um, of emergency response and recovery, and particularly for uh, extreme heat events, really important um, to, to check on people, and checking on people can be life-saving. So a heat buddy is someone you will check on or they will check on you um, when it gets hot. So particularly if you live alone, like Dr. Tron said, that very high risk um, person in, in heat. So it, it's important to have a heat buddy. Um, so if you've, you've identified your heat buddies, you should be checking on each other multiple times a day, uh, especially in the evening when, you know, the outdoor temperatures cool down, your indoor temperatures can still be quite warm. So um, checking on checking on them and then also helping them to cool down uh, if they need to or get to a cool space um, if realizing that they're not getting cool enough uh, in their own space. So someone just that you can hold accountable with each other or someone that uh, you can look after or, or check in with um, when it starts getting hot. Great, and really important role then or uh, that friend and family caregivers can be filling is to be a heat buddy to their elders. Sarah, you talked a little bit about um, indoor temperatures peaking later in the day. Um, do you know what, like, what are the hours when those indoor temperatures are peaking? I don't know the exact hours. I don't know, Dr. Schwann, if you know, but I remember reading something was around 8 p.m. Um, it's still, and it depends on, on the time of year, like when, when the sun's going down, yeah. but um, basically it's, yeah, it's that it's still still warm um, inside, uh, still till, till pretty late, which is another reason why um, during extreme heat emergencies, we extend uh, cooling hours past uh, standard opening hours for community centers and libraries because those, that's the, the critical time we want people to be cooling down. Yeah, anything you wanna add there, Dr. Schwand? Yeah, I think that Sarah said it very well. We do find that even as the outdoor temperatures start to cool off late in the afternoon, we see with the continuous exposure of the sun to, uh, to uh, windows that there's still that heating effect that occurs in spaces. It definitely depends on the specifics of the housing and the place, but the some of the studies that BCCDC has looked at or done locally have found those warm temperatures late in the afternoon or even early in the evening, so uh, three, four, five, six. PM and even, and even later than that seem to be when the temperatures can still be still be quite hot inside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we've been talking about you know the those indoor temperatures and perhaps uh, exposure to them if we're indoors. Uh, what actually happens to our bodies when we're exposed to extreme heat? And Dr. Schwann, is there a way to say that in really simple terms for us? Yeah, I'll try. I think that the it's definitely very complex processes that can lead to severe heat stroke and some of this of the major impacts of it. At the at the core, some of the pro, the very processes that help our bodies to cool off can be the can be the cause of uh, of heat illness. So when as we've all experienced when we're outside or inside and and heating up we see things like beginning to sweat is one of the ways that we cool off evaporation as well as that the blood vessels uh, at the level of our skin uh dilate or open up so that we can basically as we can um more heat can radiate from our bodies and this we've all uh, observed this or experienced this being flushed uh, and having that uh that, that uh, uh that experience is basically how our bodies are cooling off. And this can actually be very helpful for heat tolerance uh, when we're when we're outside uh, or in, in a hotter context, or even heat acclimatization over time. Our bodies, our physiology is actually very good at becoming uh, more tolerant of the heat, and this can occur even in a few weeks early in the summer. This happens uh, every year in places where we have um, seasonal changes like this. These very processes, though, can lead to symptoms. 
uh, when we have dehydration because of sweating and we have decreased blood volume, that can lead to lead to fainting because there's less blood flow to the brain. It can lead to heat cramps uh, if we have loss of uh, if we're dehydrated and have loss of salt and the other important electrolytes that we that our physiologic processes depend on. Uh, and then if we become very dehydrated or have imbalances of those electrolytes, this can lead to more severe heat exhaustion uh, and some of these other symptoms. And then as I was describing with that, um, dehy these dehydrating processes, decreased return uh, blood flow uh, back to the heart because of the all of the blood that's being sent to different parts of the body to try to cool off, that can be very stressful for the heart. So when we have what's called the decreased venous return, so the vein, our veins not bringing as much blood back to the heart uh, as is needed, this is this causes the, the heart to need to work very hard. And this can be dangerous for people who have uh, pre-existing conditions of the heart uh, and can lead to a lot of, uh, a lot of um, exacerbation potentially of um, arrhythmias uh, and even heart attacks. So there's a very complex set of conditions and, and all of these, although I'm describing the impacts on the, on the brain and the heart, it's gonna affect other organs as well. We see sort of a complex cascade uh, of inflammation that can affect other parts of the body as well. But at its, uh, at its simplest, it's the, uh, in many ways, the very processes that the body is trying to apply to cool off can lead to uh, the symptoms of heat illness. Mm. Interesting. So that actually leads into my next question. Uh, what is uh, heat related illness? Um, and again, we've heard different terms like heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Uh, what are what do these different terms mean? Yeah, there's really a broad spectrum of heat illness from the and maybe starting with the most severe when we refer to heat stroke, this is usually used to describe as a shorthand for when we see severe and neurological symptoms or really when uh, the line has been crossed the heat stroke so actually so fainting for example having decreased a decreased level of consciousness or confusion uh being less coordinated uh what there as a symptom severe symptoms of heat illness those these are the symptoms that would be described as heat stroke and they're at the core due to a, a lack of blood flow to the brain and uh, and uh and a, a really a medical emergency. So when we have symptoms like that, very important to not just cool off, but to seek medical attention promptly. Now, less severe than that, but still important are the uh, symptoms of heat exhaustion. So being uh, very dizzy, experiencing nausea or even vomiting, uh, a persistent rapid heart rate, difficulty concentrating, all of these things can be symptoms of, of heat exhaustion. And these are really important signs that we should uh, limit exertion if possible, seek a cooler space as, as soon as quick as soon as possible. And these symptoms, if we're able to get to cooler spaces and and uh, and cool off in short, should be able we should be able to reverse those symptoms and limit them. If those are persistent, uh, again, it's very important to seek medical medical attention in those cases. And then most mild of all, some of symptoms of heat is can just uh, be very, very strong sense of thirst, again, having a having flushed skin or even a skin rash, a heat rash, headache. These are things that we might have all experienced on a hot day. And again, we should not ignore those. Uh, those are important early symptoms of heat illness. And we wouldn't quite characterize those as heat exhaustion or heat stroke, but very important signs that our body's working hard to cool off. Uh, and we should try to get to a cooler space and take steps to, uh, to limit that, uh, the heat stress that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so when you were saying uh, that heat stroke is a medical emergency, we should seek attention right away. Um, does that warrant, you know, going to your emergency room or even calling 911 at that point if uh, if you're with someone who's experiencing that? Yes, if you're experiencing, for example, uh, fainting or you're with somebody who's who's uh, actually fainted or becoming confused or uh, losing, not just losing consciousness outright, but having a, a decreased level of consciousness. Yes, that would be a good reason to either get to medical attention by going to an emergency room or an urgent care center or calling 911 if necessary for, for transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's that line of moving into what we might call neurological symptoms, symptoms affecting the brain. Uh, very important to be aware that that is, uh, is a medical emergency and potentially quite harmful. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've sort of talked about the medical emergencies, emergency and also um, uh, other heat related illnesses. 
Um, but there are steps that we can be taking, of course, to prevent those uh, illnesses. Uh, what tips do you have for us, Dr. Schwant, to stay cool, both indoors and outdoors? So maybe some tips that we haven't already uh, spoken to earlier. Yeah, I'll try to build on what Sarah had said earlier. I definitely uh, reflect on some of those. Either creating or getting to a cool space, very important. Uh, Sarah described some options very well. And this is really benefits from planning ahead of time. So on, on days like today that are warm, but maybe not the not a heat warning or certainly not an extreme heat emergency, it's a good time to be thinking in, in the preseason, if you will, of how we're going to cool our space during those times or what are the places that we might be able to go to? What are those resources in our communities? You mentioned that uh, City of Vancouver map uh, that's available. It's very hard to make these decisions and sort these things out in the midst of a of a heat event where we're potentially experiencing heat illness, looking after ourselves and other people. So having that plan for how we're going to cool our space and where we might go, really important. Things that we can do aside from the space itself, using water to cool off. It sounds like a simple thing, but it's really effective for, for uh, helping our body to cool by evaporation. So the same way uh, that sweating is such a well-known way uh, that the body cools off, uh, applying cool, uh, having a cool shower, applying cool water to the body, just by something as simple as misting, uh, dampening clothing, putting our feet, ankles, or even all of our legs into, a, into cold water using a large bowl, bucket, or, or tub. These, again, these are many different options that one might create within, within your own home, even just damp towel, nice cool and damp towels on the body. All of these things can help with evaporation, and there actually is evidence that they can, those things can help out, uh, as well as being in a cooler space if possible. Um, I, and then some of the other things are just the really recommend um, monitoring the space. This came up earlier and it is very important. It can be hard to have that, that sense for whether or not the place, whether or not our measures are being effective as we're doing all of those good practices that were mentioned, closing blinds, trying to use circulating air to cool space off and so forth, but actually just monitoring the temperature and seeing are these measures, uh, have they been effective? We all know the uh, we all know the adage about how gradually increasing temperatures can be can be hard to detect. So it's I think important to keep an eye on an objective measure of whether what we're doing in the house is working to cool cool the space off. And if it's not, have a plan B to get to somewhere cooler. Great, thank you. I I love that there's simple steps with you know just using the cool water that we are have available and putting our feet in a foot bath or putting on a damp t-shirt. Those are all really simple uh, steps, so thank you. Um, and so what advice do you have, Dr. Schwann? And maybe, you know, you've already spoken to this, but I think it's even worth reiterating here. Um, what advice do you have if someone is getting too hot? And, and again, maybe just to go through, like, how do we know when we're getting too hot? Yeah. I think the key things that we'll see are some of those symptoms uh, kind of going through that spectrum of the severity of symptoms. And these are things that we uh, have uh, some, some information, uh, some graphics and so on about uh, bch.ca slash heat, our, our extreme heat website of the health authority that we're glad to share. But again, some of these milder symptoms in an indoor space, generally speaking, if we're able to get the temperature to uh, you know, under 26, as Sarah described, temperatures where uh, we think it should not be major health impacts, we should, have, we should generally be able to avoid those sorts of symptoms. If we start to have those, that's a sign that we probably need to escalate our measures to cool the space. So if, in spite of our best efforts, uh, working with neighbors or even our own within our own space or with families, experiencing symptoms like headache, continuing to have heavy sweating, some of those symptoms of, of uh, heat illness or heat exhaustion that I described, those are signs to either to increase the measures that we're taking, do more to cool off. And if we're doing everything that we can to say this space isn't going to work, it's just not going to be possible and get to a cooler space. If those options aren't available, though, uh, th this is when, uh, when uh, medical attention can become very important. In the case of heat stroke, the reason that I described that as you know, an important time to seek medical attention is because it's cooling off rapidly, but in a medically supervised way is very important. Uh, the, it's, it's, these are things that are reversible, but do need to be uh, do need to be done again in a medically um, 
medically su supervised way, monitoring not just the body temperature, but electrolyte replacements, potentially with an IV uh, and, uh, and other medical interventions can be really crucial. As I, as I described, this can be a, a, an illness that affects multiple organs of the body at once. So it is a, is a complex medical emergency to, uh, to address heat stroke. We've been talking about extreme heat and, um, it, you know, along with the heat, it can be accompanied by uh, periods of drought and with that, a higher risk of wildfires. So Dr. Schwann, what do we need to, to know and what can we do to prepare for wildfire smoke? Really important question in our day and age. And as we've seen so often, we start to have wildfires, not coincidentally overlapping with periods of, of extreme heat. There's this increased risk of ignition and, uh, and ongoing fires, and then we can have smoke exposure at the same time. Might have the same steps. There are some related steps, and one of those is making sure trying to create the uh, safer home space or get to spaces with cool and clean air. So that pair of not just cool air but clean is very is very important. So in the indoor space, again, this in some cases might mean over time we need to get to a place where housing that we're creating or that that's being retrofitted and renovated in British Columbia includes air filtration that's climate resilient and that it provides adequate filtration against wildfire smoke so this could this will involve in some cases upgrading filters over the over the course of time there's a major challenge that people often describe quite reasonably that during these uh during periods of extreme heat and wildfire smoke people are uh, looking at this tension between opening windows in the evening to cool a space off, but then also wanting to keep windows closed to keep the wildfire smoke out. And this is obviously very challenging and one of the real issues of, that we're starting to see with climate change and these intersecting uh, issues at the same time. For most people, extreme heat is going to be a greater risk than wildfire smoke. So if you're in a position where you're able to cool a space off, if, the, if uh, an indoor space would otherwise be at a dangerous temperature, first priority is to get it cool. We always say cool and clean air is the, is the best of all, but the, uh, that, uh, getting to that uh, safe indoor temperature has really got to be a priority. Definitely, wildfire smoke can have major impacts on health as well, so we want to do, we want to do both of those things. But when we're looking at that tension, and many of many of us have been have been there, deciding, geez, do I open the open the window, knowing that that's the way to cool my place off, but also that it's been a bit smoky. Usually, for most people, the, the priority needs to be getting that cool space first. But where possible, seeking spaces that combine the two. So getting to some of these places, like uh, it could be libraries, other municipal spaces, uh, even just uh, neighborhood spaces like, like cafes that might have again both cool and clean air are really going to be the uh, the uh, the best of all. Yeah, I noticed I was in one of my local public libraries recently and they had a big sign up that said that they had air filtration. So even a great thing to check in with your library librarian and see if that's a space that you might consider then um, seeking refuge in. Uh, so that's all the questions that I had prepared and I, I know we want to take some audience questions. I haven't uh, seen any come through yet in the chat or the Q&A? And I have a feeling it's because everybody's been processing uh, the information that was just shared. It was a lot of uh, information to take in. So I'm gonna give people a moment to uh, send any questions that they might have. And in the meantime, maybe I'll relay one because I was talking with somebody here at our neighborhood house who is saying uh, she has a dog and she's wondering where can she go with her dog during an extreme heat event? Sarah, are there places where, uh, that are pet friendly that people can go to? Yeah, so all the uh, community center cooling spaces allow well-behaved pets. <laughs> um, and yeah, depending on the type of pet that you have, you might wanna make sure that you have a carrier or something to, to put it in, to keep it in while, while you go to the space. Um, and that also is, um, uh, as you said, on our, our website, vancouver.ca slash hot weather with a map, um, you can click on all of the different uh, community centers and cooling centers and see the hours that they're open and if they, they take pets or not um, and any other kind of like 
um, things that you might need to know um, about the space. But yeah, we, the, we definitely, we want to keep our, our pets safe and we want to keep people safe so they will come uh, and, and, and be safe yeah, in those spaces. Great, thank you. Um, I see we have a question here from the viewing party at Collingwood Neighborhood House. Uh, they're interested to know, and maybe Dr. Schwantz, I'll put this question to you. Is it better to drink cold water or room temperature water? And, and maybe I'll build on that and ask like the same with like an ice bath or a cold bath. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, as an answer, I would split the difference and say cool water is probably the best way forward or a cool bath rather than necessarily a full on ice bath. With uh, drinking water, I mean, the benefits are this kind of two pronged because we're getting the hydration, which is very important to make sure that we have the that adequate blood volume, as I described, and that we're replacing all of the water that we're losing by sweating. And then also that direct benefit of, of cooling because we're taking in, uh, taking in cool fluids. Generally speaking, we don't want to go to extremes uh, with um, with uh, with these efforts to to adjust our body temperature. So moving slowly but surely is a good way to good way to do it. So if somebody is overheated, having some of those signs of, of heat illness that I described, taking steps like a cool bath is is probably a good measure. Trying to do that all at once, getting into a full on ice bath uh, with frigid uh, ice water is going to be pretty severe and potentially have really dramatic changes in body temperature and actually maybe complicate some of these those complex processes that can be part of part of the heat heat illness heat exhaustion and heat stroke response so i'd really recommend taking uh the the cool water approach rather than the ice cold approach if we're getting to the point that we're needing to use a full on ice bath submersion sort of approach this is really something that we think should actually be probably uh, medically supervised uh, and managed in a in a context with with good monitoring of the uh, of the person's status. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful to know. So slow and steady, not going to the extremes. Um, there's a question from someone who's joined us online, and they're wondering. So if uh, how can someone who has an out of town Sorry, let, let me just read this. How can out of town members help elders through heat? So you're caring for someone at a distance. Uh, what, what could you be doing? And I'll um, maybe ask you, Dr. Schwant, to respond to that one first. Yeah, so some really important things to do. Just again, this heat buddy concept is so, so positive and so important. Being aware of people who might be at risk, which is a lot of us, when you think of some of those risk factors that, that I was naming, this is a lot of people in our community. So we might think of people at a distance, as clearly the question is, checking in on people. And I think that first, one of the first things that might happen is just asking a person, what's your space like in terms of the temperature? Are you able to cool it off? And then rechecking on that as well at, throughout a heat event, because it might be fine at first, but over the course of time, we can have increasing heat. So checking on how the person is doing in terms of their own symptoms, if they're having any issues, staying cool, or they're starting to have symptoms of heat illness, and then also on how they're, how the they're managing, because the changes to the temperature of the space will come before, typically, the, uh, the, the status of the person and that the space will heat up first before they have heat illness naturally. So it's important to check on both the, how the person is doing, but also how, the, how their, the physical infrastructure of their apartment is or their house is, if they're able to cool it off, if they could use a hand with those things, uh, and then to, where possible, uh, offer help with those. Things. There's a couple of resources, the uh, Vancouver Coastal Health and also the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health, which is a mouthful, have uh, documents online. Again, you can get those at our website or post them with this, uh, with this um, recording on important questions to ask as part of a check-in. We think this is really important uh, to, to leverage the benefits of social connection so that we can check on one another, both our uh, direct uh, pre-planned heat buddies or others that we might think of in our communities. Uh, there's a lot of benefit there. And people have asked that exactly this question, what are some of the things I should be looking for when I call a friend or a family member to during a heat event? And so there are some really good, uh, simple checklists that one can apply in doing that. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful tips that you've shared um, here. I've looked, seeing another question. Um, here and it says, 
I believe this one is also from the Collingwood Neighborhood House Viewing Party. If a person is overweight, is there anything additional that could be done or other than what has been mentioned to keep cool? No, it would be typically the same steps would be recommended for people of various uh, various body sizes and types. The uh, really these are I think advice uh, and practices that could apply to apply to someone at uh, at any uh, at any weight or body type. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I was just actually thinking uh, back to your last response, Dr. Schwant, where you were talking about those health check-ins and that guide that's available, which we will uh, again link to and share with people who are uh, joining the viewing parties. Um, and and those are really designed for people without medical a medical background, right? To be doing a health check-in with somebody. Yeah. Is that Absolutely. These are designed so that anybody could be could pick these up and apply them. So you don't need to have a medical background or any specialized knowledge at all. It's all things that um, that a person could could basically start from scratch and, and apply those. And it's meant to be something so that community members can help uh, can help one another rather than needing a, a medical background to do so. Yes, it's a good point, Carolyn. Thanks for mentioning that. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I'm going to direct this question to you, um, and this is coming from uh, someone attending here at the Neighborhood House. Um, the question is, other cities in North America have incentivized landlords to paint black roofs white, thereby reducing solar absorption and reducing heat deaths. Could this happen here, in particular with apartment buildings? Yeah, so there's that and a, a few other kind of longer term uh, climate adaptation strategies um, that the city is looking at. I work in emergency management, which is more short term um, kind of response and recovery, but we have amazing huge teams uh, at the city working on uh, climate uh climate change and climate adaptation. So there is the uh, climate change adaptation strategy uh, that includes some of those uh, more policy and future planning um, items. And I know even just with some of the things around, there's stratas that don't allow uh, air conditioning or you know in window air conditioning units and um, some other things that the city is looking at of what are some policy changes that we can help um, on our side and even just some some education as well. I know um, from Vancouver Coastal Health and BCCDC, there's you know some push towards uh, landlords with with education that came out quite recently um, about the importance of of doing some of these things. So yeah, I think it's uh, I can't speak to exactly what some of those steps are that they're pushing on the on the policy side, but it is something that um, is is being pushed from from the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I think we have time for maybe just a couple more questions. Um, so I had one more, it's similar to what we had um, around the very cold versus room temperature. And uh, there is an older adult who wants to know if drinking uh, warm drinks in warm weather is helpful. Dr. Schwan? Typically we'd recommend uh, cooler drinks it would be the recommendation for, for cooling off. Many people do describe drinking a warmer drink as helpful because it create, does create the this uh, sensation of, the, of stimulating the body's response to cool off. Uh, but again, overall, I think because you're introducing something warmer than body temperature into the into the body, it probably is going to be moving the body temperature overall in the wrong in the wrong direction, even if it creates that that sensation of these cooling mechanisms. So I'd say during a heat event, for the purposes of cooling off, sticking with uh, cool drinks would be the recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually want to ask two more questions because I think they're both really good. Uh, we had another one from Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House here. Is there a requirement for air conditioning in long-term care facilities at the moment? Yeah, great question. Very important question. There is not right now with the just the sheer diversity of long-term care homes in our province. And of course, we have hundreds and they're in very different buildings, some of them brand new and some of them much, much older buildings. So there's not a requirement that they have the central air conditioning. What there is, is the an expectation of creating at least a cool space uh, within those within within long term care homes. So that could be a common room, it could be uh, a lounge area and things like that. And the support for long term care homes to both upgrade 
uh, to central air conditioning in some cases or use portable air conditioning in different ways. So I think that we're seeing an across the board uh, leveling up in terms of the cooling available in long-term care. But uh, as a single answer, there's not a firm requirement for air conditioning and LTC at this time. Mm -hmm. Maybe a follow-up question I would ask there is, uh, air conditioning, you know, those portable air conditioning units as um, what is the prospect of uh, those being designated as uh, required medical equipment for somebody where it would be covered under our BC healthcare? Yeah, an important question. This is something that the coroner's report after the BC heat dome had recommended that there be, there be uh, an examination of this possibility by government with, uh, with you know, the potential uh, to, uh, to take that approach. This is something that we're waiting for right now to see what approach uh, government takes to that. But the possibility of this being covered uh, for people who are receiving disability or social assistance or through other means uh, could be very positive in terms of uh, allowing people to cool their own spaces. Right, thank you. And one last question from the audience for you, Dr. Schwant. If a person has acute asthma, does uh, a mask help in a smoky environment? Great. Again, great question. And I know that many of us now having used masks uh, over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic still still have them, still use them. Uh, and when this question comes up around wildfire smoke, the key point is that an N95 mask or similar, and so similarly rated K95s, KN95s, and similar respirators can be very effective uh, at removing the harmful part fine particulate matter uh, from the air that we inhale during a wildfire event. Uh, the disposable masks, cloth masks, other face coverings don't seem to have that same effect. So it is important to note that it's res respirators, N95, uh, and, uh, and higher ratings that will be helpful. But yes, those can be helpful for uh, if we need to be outside uh, or and exposed to smoky air. That's a, That would be a, a, a good move. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to give each of you, uh, Dr. Schwann and Sarah, uh, maybe the final word here. Uh, what is one takeaway that each of you would want people to leave with today? And Sarah, would you like to start and then Dr. Schwann, you can follow? Yeah, totally. So I think, well, we've obviously already covered it, but um, taking steps today to be prepared and plan for when heat comes. Um, our website, vancouver.ca slash hot weather, um, kind of goes over everything we talked about today, the steps that you can do to prepare, the map for where the cooling centers are, how to put your own cool kit together. Um, that's all on there. And you can even sign up for Alertable, which is our, the city's public alerting. We use it for extreme heat emergencies, but any other type of emergency as well. Um, that could be another good thing that someone asked about if they don't live here, uh, you know, how can they help people uh, that live, um, you know, they don't live in the same place. So being able to monitor some of those channels um, and, and get that information, um, particularly if, if um, you know, we're talking about older adults that maybe are not, you know, don't have smartphones or, or aren't getting information the same way that they are. So making your plan today um, and start taking action, yeah, today before it gets hot. Great, thanks, Sarah. Dr. Schwann? Yeah, just to close up, I would really want to stress the importance of social social isolation as a risk factor during heat heat events, and maybe to just to close phrasing it more positively, the importance of social connection as a protective factor. We know again the tragic toll of the heat dome in 2021. But we also know the countless, countless interventions and opportunities that were taken of pe where people were checking on family members and friends, organizations like neighborhood houses and others reaching out to people during this event, knowing that people might be at risk, helping out, helping out one another. So the preventive uh, benefit there and the, um, the again, the benefits of, uh, of social connection and, and, um, and community support are really quite large. And I think that that's something that uh, really delighted to see so many organizations and people tuning in to work on right now. Thank you. I think that's a lovely note to end on. Um, and I want to thank you both for your time today. I'm going to hand it back over to Devika to say a few words. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was some really wonderful information and I really appreciated um, the panelists sharing their, their knowledge with us. 
Um, and, you know, in particular for me, what stood out having being a caretaker for an elder is understanding the different stages of the heat related illness and knowing when to seek um, so seek support uh, for, for a family member should you need to do so. Um, as Carolyn has already indicated, we will be broadcasting this um, uh, event on our Mount Pleasant YouTube channel. Um, so please, please stay tuned um, for more information about that over the next few days. Um, and we do have some representation here from our co-partners, our neighborhood houses. Um, and so Little Mountain, Collingwood, and Gordon House, um, there are also wonderful resources um, if folks are looking for support in their neighborhood. These neighborhood houses and other community resources are great places to walk into to get additional support. Um, once again, I would like to thank our partners and our funders, the United Way in the city of Vancouver um, for, uh, for providing us the support to put on this event. Um, and uh, prizes. Um, I do believe that there's gonna be some prizes of cooling kits. Um, at all the respective watch parties and um, and also um, a cooling kit for folks that have joined in through community and they'll be notified through email um, for that for that prize. Um, thank you again for everyone taking the time to join us today. I think this was a very important and informative conversation.